in 85, now we're about 83, 85 he came to San Francisco on a, uh, to promote uh, Tough Guys Don't T Dance, a paperback, and he stayed in the uh, St. Francis. And uh, of course Random House paid the bill. He was promoting it so he didn't have any expenses. And uh, we drove up the coast, it was very beautiful, to Big Sur. And uh, he, he, I don't know, um, well, I left out one part, but I don't know what was in his head driving up the, uh, the coast, but he wanted to make love in this house that was this fantasy house. And I kept thinking, oh, this is going to be a villa like the south of France and <laughs> some ex outrageous, gorgeous uh, thing. We got there, well, the, the screens were falling out of the windows, the toilets didn't flush, <laughs> there were cockroaches running around the floor. And this was his fantasy house. I don't know what he was doing. I don't know whether he was creating a chapter for Harlot's Ghost he was working on, which is possible, that he wanted to have sex with somebody in this house and put it in the book. I don't know. But writers do that kind of thing. In any event, he sat on a thorn. He was now had his pants down. He sat on a thorn out in the back and and it got stuck in his butt, butt and I, I wouldn't have sex there. I said, no, this is ridiculous. <laughs> so we had to go back to the hotel and have me take the thorn out. That was our romantic interlude. I went back to New York, and uh, he told me I just checked. Oh, she, Myrna's checking. I thought, my, do I have a twin? <laughs> this is, she's doing the taping. I know, but you see, it wasn't rewound all the way, so I don't know well, if I'm going to lose. Well, you do the best you can. We have a, we have but sound on that around, too. Before I started, this is my friend and publicist. <laughs> if you ever need a wonderful one, Myrna Post, she's wonderful. And um, so we went back to the hotel, and then we went and walked around Koi Tower and did that kind of thing. And um, uh, there was a mirror on the armoire. Uh, and I was in the bathroom and I came out uh, after bathing and he had his foot in my stocking and I said, Norman, that's not my thing. So he took it out and he looked forlorn. <laughs> but he had one foot in, in my high heel and one in the stocking. I, I, that just, you know, and he was very good natured when I said no. He didn't get upset, but uh, he had a bizarre appetite. Um, so, uh, let me see. Uh, I got an apartment in New York in 86, and that's when he was president of Penn. I don't know if you ever remember the Penn. He did a, a fabulous uh, presentation for Penn. Um, it says in this I interviewed him for L. Um, Two time Pulitzer Prize. National Book Awards, 25 books and six de decades under his belt. Mailer believes he's old enough to begin what he calls his church work. Indeed, one of Mailer's presidential duties was to host the Penn Celebration, eight Sunday evenings in a theater in each, e in each evening. Two American writers read from their works, debate, get lots of applause, lots of laugh, and raise lots of money. Among the celebrants were Saul Bellow and Eudora Welty, Isaac Singer, Alice Walker, John Updike, and Woody Allen. It was a really lovely, lovely event he did, and he raised a lot of money for, uh, for Penn. Um, so I had an apartment there, and I was going to all the openings, and I met a very handsome man named Pierre Trudeau. And Pierre and I went to lunch, we to the Russian Tea Room, but they didn't know who he was, so they put us in Siberia, which I happened to tell page six and never saw Pierre again. So, but Pierre wanted to uh, meet Norman, and I arranged the introduction. But in, in typical, the way these male psyches, instead of allowing me to introduce Pierre to Norman, I was cut out of the middle. I introduced Pierre to Norman's uh, lackey. Well, it's not lackey. He was a very good friend, Bob Lucid. He was a professor. But then Bob took made the introduction for Norman so that I was cut out of it. And that's how they operate. They're very slick. Um, 
But that's all right. I didn't need the credit. But I felt I, it wasn't all right because I felt a little manipulated, or rather a lot. Um, so in any event, that was uh, I had the apartment in New York. And Warren Beatty was at a party at Gene Stein's, uh, one of the many parties, and that was very, very uh, funny to see him. Um, I left out the beginning when we met. The first thing he took me to was to um, a place called Mount Desert. Is it up in uh, Maine? Desert. Desert. Is it? Desert. 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 Thank you. And because, yeah, I get it. It was close. I get my S's mixed up. But in any event, he was uh, starting Harlot's Ghost there, his book about the CIA, and we went up <laughs> together, <coughs> and he had an empty briefcase with an apple in it, and when we left it was filled, and um, we climbed Beehive Mountain, and the point is I'm the mistress in this Harlot's Ghost, so that's how he got his material, uh, the beginning. Um, so now we're back to, uh, in 86, um, he came to cast the movie Tough Guys Don't Dance in Hollywood. And I introduced him to a lot of my friends, Alana Hamilton and Valerie Perrine, and uh, arranged for them to uh, be audition. audition. <laughs> Well, an audition to Norman was, you know, and to anyone in Hollywood, let's get real what these auditions are about. You know, they tell you to come sexy, and you meet, uh, in Norman's case, a dirty old man. I mean, the, the actress is set up. Uh, but I, I still thought that they would, uh, might, it might help Norman. I was always trying to help Norman. Uh, he, in, in the event, found to two women, and I tested and I was manipulated because he, he never intended to to have me in it, but that's all right. Uh, I, I had a man called Seymour Cassell read my uh, scene with me, and uh, when Seymour kissed me in front of the, uh, um, the crew, there was a Fred Roos and these very... Uh, big producers, uh, Norman exploded and uh, everybody ran out of the room. So he didn't want me to kiss somebody in front of him. He was, he, well, he did care about me, uh, or his ego did. I don't know if there's a difference between men sometimes, men, ego and uh, caring. And But in the event, he exploded and uh, I never got the part. But what I did get was to interview him for Us Magazine and for you you in uh, London, and uh, I interviewed Isabella Rossellini, and he offered me this horrible part of a girl in a G-string, you know, the opening the door of a scene, and I said, no, I wouldn't do it. But I did get to further my, my writing, and, uh, and that's real, excuse me, really why I was with Norman so long. To, uh, I wanted to learn to write. I, I respected his uh, written words, and... Um, I love to watch him. I love to be a student. Having him teach me was better than sex. It was a, a really a wonderful high to see his, him concentrate on my words and mark them. And he did it for eight years, and in the end, I sold them all to Harvard. So I had that many, and, uh, and they are valuable. And he gave me what he could give me. He couldn't give me marriage, but he could give me his mind for eight years and his wisdom. <clears throat> and for that I'm very grateful and will always uh, be. Uh, what I also want to say is I'm a recovering alcoholic. I got sober in 1980. So all my writing, no matter what it is, is based on sobriety. And that doesn't mean it has to be about drinking. It's about the thinking behind the drink. So I kept thinking that I was what's called 12-stepping Norman because Norman <laughs> when we were in San Francisco, I gave him a quiz. I had th there's a quiz to find out if you're an alcoholic, and if you have three yeses, <clears throat> you are. Well, he had five. I said, Norman, you're an alcoholic. He said, Let me take the quiz again. <laughs> so he took it again, and he wasn't, but he was. So uh, I was hoping in my writing to get the message. It's called give the message to him about sobriety, and. Uh, that's what all my work is really based on. Uh, and why I write, like to write about sex is because 
uh, I had a terrible time learning to make love sober. Uh, and when I was drunk, I was able to overcome fears. But in, in sobriety, uh, you're haunted with the comparison to how it used to be. So I write graphically for that reason. And anybody who's really had a problem can see that or perhaps understand that I'm essentially trying to explain to the reader the difference uh, between sober sex and uh, alcoholic sex. And uh, when you use marijuana or alcohol, you're not having, making love to the person, you're making love to the uh, drug. So you're, you're just a, a victim of that substance. It's not the same. So all those raw feelings and emotions come just to the surface when you try to make love sober and you're used to the thing. And I, that's what I talk about. So there's a 50-page sex scene of Norman in here, and it's all dealing with my fears and that kind of stream of consciousness of over, overcoming uh, sex.